following interview was conducted with Larry Prio, Executive Director Emeritus of the Purdue Alumni Association. This is part two of the oral history interview when it took place on Thursday, October 23rd, 2008 in Stewart Center. Welcome. Thank you. Nice Thank to you. be back. Good to be back. Okay. Um, we'll start with where we left off. Let's talk a little bit about diversity and within the Alumni Association and, and how that, you know, sort of changed over time or any comments on that. Uh, we, uh, when we started uh, following Joe Rudolph in uh, 88, uh, one of our very first stated goals was to uh, address diversity uh, so that the membership in the Purdue Alumni Association reflected uh, diversity numbers uh, in the student population and in the alumni population. Uh, we were not uh, a hundred percent successful but we began to have, a, I thought, a, a strong interface with uh, uh, the Black Cultural Center and their uh, developed, it probably was in its embryotic stages back in the late 80s, uh, but it became uh, a stronger uh, black alumni association. Uh, we created a voting uh, seat on our board of directors for uh, that diversity representation, uh, but we uh, so we we had that on our we 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 addressed it on our board of directors, uh, but in the general club structure around the country, uh, it. Uh, alumni clubs. The alumni clubs, yes. Uh, not the John Purdue Club, uh, not the Ag Alumni. Uh, th there even began some President's Council clubs. I'm not referring to those, uh, but the Alumni Association infrastructure club system, uh, woefully short of, of uh, uh, minority representation and uh, the, the I, I believe the challenge was both for uh, the majority club membership to embrace uh, that diversity issue and for our uh, underrepresented minorities uh, to feel now all of a sudden just because Larry Prio and the Alumni Association said please join us uh, for them in their respective communities um, that uh, that didn't happen. It, it, it didn't happen uh, certainly by, see I left in 2004 and I, I, I really can't speak to the, the success they've had since then. However, I do note as I, uh, uh, like most alums, received the alumnus magazine uh, I think we get it about six, seven times a month now, or a, time, <laughs> a year. My God, a month, uh, a year. Uh, there appears to be a very good representation of, of uh, the diversity issues in each issue. Uh, whether uh, that is representative of the membership or around the country, I, I right. just really can't say. That brings up one of the questions I was going to ask. What was the liaison with the Black Alumni Association and the Ag Alumni Association and the Purdue Alumni Association? Um, the, um, the, it, it was... For the researchers, because they, they may hear the names mm -hmm. and they... And will wonder what... The, we were uh, quasi-cleaved at the hip, but no official... Uh, we were each our own silo, the Ag Alumni Association, and uh, how that began. Uh, I long often, time. a long, 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 long time ago. Uh, certainly, uh, as I uh, moved in in '88, uh, Maury Williams. Williamson was was the executive director, and they did a wonderful job with uh, that constituency. We. Uh, did joint programming, but uh, clearly ag grads, not that they did not join the Purdue, uh, the Purdue Alumni Association, uh, 
but they joined in significantly greater numbers the Ag Alumni Association. And that was the only, at, at Purdue, the only school that had their independent, they had a, a full-time director, uh, director paid staff, uh, and they had support staff along with Maury. When Maury retired, uh, Danya Lester was hired, uh, and I believe Danya was even able to add staff. Uh, assistant directors at a greater number than there were on board when Murray uh, was uh, director. And I, I would suggest <laughs> as the researchers look at this, uh, if they can figure it out, I'd love to, I'd love to know historically how that, uh, that silo was created. But it, uh, one of the differences uh, and, and this might be part of its, its historical development. Maury and Danya and their staffs are members of the Purdue University staffs. The Purdue Alumni Association, myself and, and our, we had 35, 37 full-time staff members, we were not Purdue University employees. We were uh, and still are employees of the Purdue Alumni Association, a self-governed, independent, separate good, 501 good C3. Right. Uh, the, the university, uh, thank God, embraced the Purdue Alumni Association in that uh, we, uh, we shared university facilities, we had access to all university facilities. Myself and the Purdue Alumni Association staff enjoyed the same fringe benefit program that university employees did. Now, we paid for it. I mean, we as the association uh, reimbursed and or paid for it directly uh, each month, but the university was kind enough to include us in their group negotiations for all of those fringe Plans. benefits. Oh, and what a what a joy that was. So when we recruited and replaced staff, uh, I uh, I had the I had the perception that my first uh, appropriate pool would be Purdue University current employees or uh, graduate students or uh, fellowship students, and then the greater uh, public at large. Uh, and w for example, our business managers. I uh, we replaced business managers three times while I was at per while I was employed, and each time, knock on wood, we were able to attract a uh, seated. Uh, business manager for one of the schools. One came from Residence Life and one came from the Bursar's office and what a, a great advantage that was for us. One, they, they kept their fringe benefit program, it sure. didn't even miss a, a beat. And uh, the, the great complexities, I have such a great respect for people who can handle the business end. Uh, they knew where a few of the skeletons were buried and they understood uh, the interface with the various foundations, all of which is, as you know, at Purdue, the complexity of the relationships between right. foundations. And somebody like ourselves who were you know, treated like favored, we had favored nation status, but we were ambassadors without portfolio. Uh, and in that same light, uh, I served on two different presidents cabinets. Uh, there was at one time even a, a challenge uh, by a faculty member slash group that suggested the PAA representative should not be on the, in, you know, share in sanctum sanctorum kinds of uh, deliberations because we were not Purdue University employees. Uh, legal counsel eventually uh, suggested to President Beering, it's okay. <laughs> so we continued, uh, and, and I, I believe we provided uh, 
the kinds of counsel, and we never voted, and I don't know that that President Jiski or President Beering ever suggested we should vote in those uh, uh, deliberations, but we tried to represent the voice of, of alumni yeah. from around the country. Right. So, yeah. uh, and the the uh, the the Black Alumni Association is even a separate. I don't know. That one started in the 70s, maybe? Could have been. Yeah, it was certainly in place. Uh, it may have been around the time, maybe, the NSB, the National Society for Black Engineers. Yes, ma'am. Um, yes. Um, the they, when they... That, when they and they that was founded here, that, and that first started, right. and, uh, and there was grown. often oh t yeah. today I think right. it's uh, it's a major force. It was often uh, in in the early eighty or in the late eighties and the early nineties. I found there was a lot of confusion when when our alumni uh, at large and even our student body. This, the difference between the uh, Black Cultural Center and the Black Alumni Association. Those two groups, uh, like in any development of groups, there were times when they were very, very close and times when they chose to take significantly different positions on any number of issues. Uh, and, and those... Uh, differentiations between the groups helped certainly helped uh, us administratively begin to understand uh, where so we really had two uh, strategies one to deal with the on-campus uh, black cultural center and their staff and their student group and then the uh, uh, black alumni organization the black alumni organization was even a, a separate configuration than the Ag alumni. Ag alumni were Purdue University employees. The Purdue Alumni Association, we were our own independent group, and the Black Cultural or the Black Alumni Organization were volunteers. Was who they have no director or anything? No, Do no, they have an office? At uh, they did not uh, up until 2004, and they were self anointed, you know. We, we are that, therefore we are that because we say we are. And, and, and frankly, that is a, uh, an issue with alumni, uh, not only with Purdue alumni, but the uh, alumni issues around the country with every university, and certainly Purdue. There'd be a group in, uh, let's say, Fort Wayne who'd say, hey, we want to start our Purdue alumni group. We, we don't care for what's going on with the John Purdue Club or the President's Council and certainly Larry and his PAA group, and they would call themselves the Purdue alumni, and they would do any, any Even sort. Even different than the club. It's not oh, the yeah, club. not the club. Yeah, they, and the, uh, sometimes their practices, and I'm picking on Fort Wayne, and, and that's not a good place to I'm, – I'm, it's, it's, it was never an issue in Fort Wayne. But there were spots where uh, they uh, different cities, or whatever. different cities, and they would have uh, often uh, when it surfaced, it surfaced to the management of the Purdue Alumni Association and the university, not because of their good works, but often because they were on the fringe of of. Uh, not quite inappropriate behavior, but behavior that needed to move into the in, into the current century. Yeah. They often uh, uh, reflected behaviors of the old uh, good old boys club, male only, uh, drink beer, watch football games, uh, smoke cigars, um, and like not, the gentlemen's club to some yes, ma'am. To a gentleman's right. club, a, a stag, they'd get together a couple of times a year, perhaps once, at least what surfaced with us. So it would be once usually around the old oak and bucket time, and then once in the summer for a golf outing. And they were uh, uh, sometimes resembled uh, sophomoric college fraternity parties so uh, we would and they were all always very uh, gracious when we approached them and said guys you can't you know you can't use Purdue's name that's a trademark name you can't you can't do that and you don't want to do these kinds of uh, events with these kinds of functions and 
and uh, just respect your your great university and boom that that's real right. quick isn't one of the oldest ones uh, having done some work on McCutcheon the Chicago is one of the oldest yes and I think it goes back to uh, McCutcheon and um, aid sort yep. of started that when they left here a and, absolutely and they had a big we've got some publications in archives that events that they had and they used mm -hmm. to take the train and come down and mm -hmm. uh, one of the books that McCutcheon wrote, I recall that. Yes, I, I mentioned the old oaken bucket. The old oaken bucket was given to Purdue University from the Chicago Club. That's where it, uh, there, there's often, I, I've, I've read and heard some other stories, but I, I at least, <laughs> I, I guess I'm, I'm showing my prejudice here. I choose to believe, and I've seen enough documentation, that it was th that McCutcheon aid uh, generation and the Chicago Club, they're affiliated with the Chicago Club, that, yeah. that even yeah. though it was an Indiana bucket off an Indiana farm, it was the Chicago Club that, were the, that, that put it, that together, that put it together, right? yes right, ma'am. Yeah. Um, let's talk, talk about some special events that you have, like homecoming and the Gala Week, and uh, mm -hmm. those they changed. You try to keep them pretty much the same or the format. Uh, uh, excellent question. Uh, they and also class gifts. But certainly, it's appropriate. This weekend is a good example with the gateway to the future, yes. the arch. P perhaps I might address the the class gifts because it's probably the easiest, okay. simply because uh, it was not a responsibility or a uh, an effort that was uh, under our administrative structure our the Purdue Alumni Association okay. the class gift uh, efforts were uh, managed and created managed staffed by uh, University Advancement Office uh, development right, okay. uh, formerly Chuck Wise and and now uh, Mr. Murray Blackmore. Oh my God, Murray. 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 <laughs> I've spent every single day of my life with Murray, and I just blanked on his name. That yes, yeah. with the, that's a, 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 a development staff function. Uh, we would certainly help uh, design, attend, staff the the functions around the country. But it really was a, a So you a worked development. together. Yes, we worked together, but sure. I, I, I really want the historians to understand uh, that simply meant that we might have waved at them uh, and, and spoke nice of it, but it was just not sure. a, since it was a, fun, a fundraising issue. Uh, homecoming and, and Gala Week, uh, as the old saw goes, the more they change, the more they stay the same. Uh, Homecoming in the mid to late 90s was really in our perception, our, the Purdue Alumni Association's perception, a dying, uh, a dying activity. All around the country, uh, there were fewer and fewer homecoming functions uh, such as parades and homecoming and home, homecoming queens and kings, that kind of thing. And the thing. displays. And the displays. On campus. Uh, Purdue was the last of the Big Ten schools. Uh, we were still doing a homecoming parade and some sort of displays and inviting where other universities uh, in the Big Ten had all stopped that because of, I'm sure, multiple reasons, but if... If one could identify it, it was that as, as universities have grown and matured, students who graduate no longer, and I'm making it sound like it, this is a hard and fast rule, but no longer identify with Purdue at large, but identify with I am a CFS graduate of 94 whose major in that school was. And you say, come back to Purdue. And, and they, don't, they don't come back to Purdue. The, you know, their student peer group might have been 31,000 students on campus, and they just did not identify with it. And universities then began to de-emphasize the institutional homecoming and focusing on 
CFS homecoming and engineering homecoming. Mm -hmm. uh, and as, as those concepts matured, the functions were really driven at the school level. So the, the kind of parent, or we were the, the umbrella, they didn't need us. And uh, it just began to fade and fade. And then Murray Blackwelder arrived and Murray re-energized uh, homecoming. Uh, it just knocked our socks off. I mean, he, uh, he had ideas and, and the finances to back up those ideas that uh, heretofore our little association uh, we could not touch. Uh, and he, he and the university can, uh, continued to be gracious about, Larry, PAA, please work with us on this. And we absolutely did. Uh, but clearly the, they had the pocketbook. They had the staff. They had, uh, uh, Murray had the school alumni personnel reported to the development office, not to PAA. So the director of alumni affairs at uh, uh, the School of Engineering was not uh, a staff member or even a dotted line to Purdue Alumni Association. They were funded and reported directly to development. and through development. Uh, and, and that brings in a whole, whole different look. Uh, it, and it was a positive one at Purdue. Uh, and I believe it was positive primarily because uh, Murray Blackwelder and his staff embraced the Purdue Alumni Association and said, let's make this happen together, uh, even though... <laughs> sure, <it's okay. laughs> the, it can be seamless. Oh, ab be absolutely, and, right. and, and, it, it, and it was. And right. it was. So uh, homecoming and Gala Week. Gala Week tended uh, and tends to stay more... Uh, uh, ceremonially bound than the homecoming. Homecoming is has uh, is a bit more dynamic than Gala Week. Gala Week really uh, has the classes come back as a group, and uh, they're still the older generation who uh, were here in the '40s and '50s, and that's a different breed of cat than the the, the, the current alums. And the tradition, one of the traditions is you still go to John Purdue's grave. They still march, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, uh, the uh, uh, alumni professionals from around the country uh, would refer to uh, our practice of visiting John Purdue's grave as the, the death march because it was so unique. I mean, uh, if, if I spoke... Not many schools have a similar... Oh, no. Uh, I mean, I, I know of none. I know of none. Uh, at our annual pro, uh, alumni professional conference, every other year there would always be at the general session with hundreds of professionals present say, Purdue, would you please tell us that it's not a joke you really do and tell us again what it is you do. And that was the, the, the walk to, the John, to John Purdue's grave, the, the playing of taps, the laying of a wreath, uh, the speaking of the president of the 50th and the 25th anniversary class and the president of the university and myself. And we also, did you, uh, the oldest alum, isn't he the one that carries the, uh, the lead flag? The, the lead flag. Uh, and for years, you might remember uh, that individual, and I've, shame on me, I'm, I'm blanking on his name, but he... Uh, was a contemporary of Lindbergh. He and Lindbergh were in the same uh, flying class uh, when they got their their wings, and they actually had a mid-air accident, and they both survived. And of course, this is this is the uh, and this was in newspaper reporting, and they had a fist fight. <laughs> <laughs> once they, once the the two gentlemen got down to the ground, recognized that they were still alive, 
uh, they each blamed the other and, and had a fist fight. And this was reported in, in the papers, yes. What a small yes. world. Yes. <laughs> um, the Purdue Alumni Recruiting for Tomorrow, that was a collaboration with the Office of Admissions. You make a comment on that? Uh, uh, one, of, uh, uh, one of the feathers in, in, in our staff's hat, the staff uh, from uh, b both organizations uh, almost simultaneously saw the need for it. We had this, uh, and we still do, uh, a very extensive Purdue Alumni Club around the country. There's hardly a community. Uh, I believe we had 110 at, at the, its highest amount. Uh, we, the, the uh, admissions office realized they could not attend all of the, the, well, the various uh, recruiting efforts. Our alumni found it the most, uh, one of the most invigorating uh, exciting activities we would ask them to do and they they would attend the uh, the high school gymnasium uh, admission fairs and even though they could answer perhaps one tenth of the questions they had a, a strong presence they we even did uh, instructional seminars for them uh, but the best thing they would do would be to smile and shake a hand and look at mom and dad in the eye and say, you know, I, I, if sure. I could go through it, so can your son and daughter, and they got them the, the right answers. So. At the local level. Yes, ma'am, yeah. and it really was. It was right at the, at the grassroots level. Uh, and uh, Are they still doing that? I believe so, yeah. yes, ma'am. Okay. In fact, I'm sure they were because I was asked to uh, – uh, attend uh, one and represent uh, one of the clubs in, in one of the regions here. And, oh, good. And, yeah, so it was, it was nice. cute. You were a fact fellow at Wiley? Yes, at Wiley. Uh, my son was uh, lived at Wiley, and my daughter, gosh, Meredith and, and a couple of others. But I was, uh, as an undergraduate, I lived in Wiley for about a year, a year and a half, uh, and that was one of the, the – of the, activities I was able to squeeze in. I eventually had to resign the FAC fellow because for alumni work, it, it really wasn't done much of it on campus. I, I spent so much time off campus, but I started as a FAC fellow at Wiley while a, while the director of the recreational gymnasium. And uh, Wiley is perfect because as the kids will say at Wiley, I can roll out of bed and and roll into the sure. correct just in, in the morning. It was a great experience to be with I young people. From what I'm hearing from people now that the, uh, the food courts, and, uh, the, food, the dining facilities are sort of consolidated and they're not in the individual. Mm -hmm. Certainly I'm a fact fellow at Tarkington and it does make a difference. It does, does it? Because you used to just go over there and have dinner mm -hmm. in there, so... But it, it'll work out. I mean, yeah, it's I, a good program. Yes. Um, Purdue Alumni Foundation, you were the executive director. Can you tell us what that foundation uh, is? Yes, that, that uh, in a, it's no longer operable. The Purdue Alumni Foundation uh, was the first um, organization to be uh, granted a 5013C or C3. Uh, to be able to raise funds for the university. And its original name, and now this is going to be a stretch for my memory, uh, was the Purdue uh, Scholarship Foundation, which morphed into the Purdue Alumni Foundation. And it was the university's very first uh, efforts, uh, I think it was under Hovde, when they concluded we do need to raise some private funds they had to get that uh, IRS designation, and th that occurred. It morphed into the Purdue Alumni Foundation as the university again matured and realized this is big business uh, fundraising. So the university created uh, their own development office, and, and under the university auspices uh, got their 501c3. Uh, so the Scholarship Foundation uh, turned into the Purdue Alumni Foundation. And because of laws, uh, IRS laws and rules, once a contribution is made, it must stay in that entity 
to which it was given. So the Purdue Alumni Foundation uh, ceased to be an active fundraising arm of the university, and it was not a fundraising arm of the Purdue Alumni Association, but it was the repository of millions of dollars uh, that had been contributed in those early years of Purdue's development. So we had a foundation board who uh, they had, uh, frankly, little discriminatory dollars in which to award scholarships and grants. Was but that the purpose of it primarily for scholarships? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes. So, uh, student scholarship. Student scholarship. Uh, the... Uh, in 1939, if far, uh, Farmer Yankus uh, made a, a gift to the university, it was often in, in the in the form of real estate, and it was given to the Purdue Alumni Foundation to the university. But the university, because of IRS rules, are much more complex than I could even begin to address. It had to stay in the foundation. So because that was the recipient of that the was the recipient of the gift, and the proceeds were used to the benefit of Purdue University. Uh, and, and there are a number of foundations. I referenced earlier the complexity of the foundation issues at Purdue. There's a Ross Aid Foundation that uh, just uh, deals with the, the the land that the stadium sits on is not really. Purdue University, it's the Ross Aid Foundation, which is governed by Purdue University's Research Foundation. So it, uh, right. it, it as I mentioned, the, uh, I have a great respect for those individuals that can keep that straight. But the Purdue Alumni Foundation, uh, we had a board, and it, uh, it met a couple of times, three times a year, and by charter, uh, the president of Purdue University sat on it the president of the Purdue Alumni uh, Association, uh, the executive director of the association, and the Purdue Research Foundation. Those were the four permanent members of the board. And then I believe we had about five or six members at large that we elected. Uh, for example, it was w we used it for uh, not only the the distribution of, of some of the wealth. Most of the wealth that was in the foundation was uh, it was driven by the contribution originally. So when Farmer Smith gave 500 acres, it was, it was given uh, to the foundation to be used for the university for scholarships, for uh, young men and women who uh, came from that county, and in perpetuity, that is how that gift had to be used. So the foundation board members, we had no, no impact on how we could use those dollars. But there were some unrestricted gifts that over time uh, equaled uh, 10 or 11 million, and the income generated from that we were able to give to various schools, and that's how it was used at various schools for scholarships, for minorities, for uh, underrepresented groups, etc. But we would often use the board uh, to be able to attract individuals to get involved with the university who later would go on to be university trustees uh, and to have a, a we hoped a, a greater a greater impact on the university. Mike Burke, who's now a university trustee, the Burke Boilermaker Golf Complex, the nanotechnology. His first involvement with Purdue was with the Purdue Alumni yeah. Foundation, uh, and he was a, a very not well known pitcher. He pitched at Purdue as an undergraduate about the same time I was here and we used to hide out in Pinky Newell's training room to, to stay away from <laughs> Coach Mullenkoff and whoever the baseball coach was at the time. Uh, so a number of men and women uh, we were able to hopefully engage uh, the university. Between 80, excuse me, between 04 and 06, uh, my predecessor uh, or my successor, uh, 
believe his name was Todd Coleman. Todd and the board of directors of the Purdue Alumni Association, in concert with the Purdue Research Foundation and the university and legal counsel, uh, the Purdue Alumni Foundation was uh, uh, folded into the Purdue Research Foundation, and there is no longer the Purdue Alumni Foundation. It was dissolved. There is the term I was okay. looking okay. for. All righty. Um, let's see. You served. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about. Um, um, you served under Dr. Baring and Dr. Jeske, didn't you? Yes. And you were on the council, and you've addressed that. Which yes, ma'am. Good, right? And did. you did some trial. Dr. Baring, you mentioned, did some trips. Trips. Oh, Dr. Baring. Uh, one of his efforts. Uh, uh, he embraced the uh, the concept and the ability to have personal one-on-one -on -one time with uh, people they were um, soliciting for major funds. And uh, uh, he and uh, the director of the uh, President's Council, Carolyn Geary, uh, just a uh, it started off about once every three years, and then it was once every other year, and then each year there would be one major trip, one travel site. And often Steve and Jane uh, would have small weekend trips, and it, they were billed as a weekend with Steve and Jane at, at Breckenridge or uh, elsewhere in the country. And uh, although I don't know what their numbers were, uh, I hear regularly from alumni who uh, speak so very highly of that experience of really getting to know, and, and from a from a fundraiser's perspective, uh, Steve and Jane were able to to develop great uh, great personal relationships, which uh, we hope uh, resulted in. Uh, sure. It's a little uh, on the low end, more more personalized. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Group, yeah. Where, group. where 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 Dr. Jiski, uh, uh, he traveled. Uh, I don't know that they traveled as much as as the Beerings. Uh, Martin was uh, just an excellent excellent fundraiser. He was just uh, he, he and and uh, Marie Blackwelder. Uh, Watching them and, and, and recognizing the strategies they put together, uh, being with them, at that they they were absolute experts at it. Uh, they they forgot more than most presidents and chief alumni or chief development officers will ever know mm -hmm. of, of, about Sounds what they like do. Right. Yeah, did they you do great. some international travel with the Bearings? They took some trips. Yes, yeah. they, they did uh, mm -hmm. the, the, at least yeah, once a year. To visit some of the clubs. Yeah, we would visit clubs, and it would also be his uh, annual travel with Steve and Jane to Scandinavia, to uh, Australia, to Germany. Uh, but we would also do, uh, at the end or at the beginning of a lot of those trips, uh, Steve and Jane and my wife and I, we would... Uh, spend maybe four days. Uh, if, if it's Thursday, it's Belgium. Kind of uh, each day we would touch all, an alumni group in in a country or in a city within the country. In, in Germany, uh, Steve's heritage, right. we would often do uh, a city a day, and, and th they would turn out great numbers to, to see Steve and Jane Beering. Uh, we would also we also had uh, uh, alumni clubs in in most of Asia, uh, Hong Kong, Taipei, uh, South Korea, and we would uh, travel there. Uh, brutal, brutal uh, travel schedules, but you just had <laughs> you know, it was always interesting to me when people say, "Oh." What a great job you have, Larry. And I, I, I absolutely did. I would never have had the opportunity to travel to, uh, these, some of these to, places. to South Korea. But in reality, not but, yes, it was wonderful. But, but in reality, 
all one sees is airport terminals and hotel lobbies. And you, 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 you land at the airport, you get transported to the hotel, you, you might have a couple of hours to, to, to change your clothes, and you get ready and you have a, a reception and a dinner. Right. The next morning you get up, you run back to the airport, you fly to another city, and you do the same thing. Uh, not only internationally, but you do that uh, in the States. In fact, now my wife and I, we, we have a list of, of locations we want to visit that we have visited before, but all we saw were the airport and the terminals hotels. and the hotels. <laughs> and everybody told us it was just a great, <laughs> a great area. What so, a great opportunity. Yeah, right? what a great opportunity, <laughs> yes. Right. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about some of your awards. You're the president of the Council of Alumni Association Executives. Are you still the president? Uh, no, the, the president is uh, like like most uh, professional organizations. It's a volunteer position. Uh, okay. You know, in in it's C A A E Council of Alumni Association Executives. It's uh, the it represents the hundred largest alumni associations in the country. Uh, or school. So it's the uh, uh, individuals, men and women from around the country, from most of the the very largest, most prestigious schools in in America. Uh, you know, you as a as a, a a professional going through your career, when I felt that the things were solid enough on campus, I began to get involved in my professional organization and. You know, you, you you work your way through the chairs. You do all of the scut work, and uh, I was rewarded. Uh, eventually, became president uh, in '03. Uh, when I retired in '04, the, this organization has always been. Uh, we've never had any f- any employees. Everything has been driven by volunteers. Uh, but as I retired in '04. Uh, the organization asked me uh, for very part-time pay. <laughs> I want to be very clear about that. For for very part-time pay, would you stay on and and be the grand poobar of the organization? Uh, we're getting a little bit more complex, a little bit larger, and and as as those organizations mature, we begin to do more things. And sure. it was getting a little bit beyond what the uh, we as volunteers could do so. I do that now, um, a couple of hours a day. Uh, uh, would would hate to even call it a quarter time, uh, but when I'm bored, or uh, especially in the winter, I'm probably at it six seven hours a day because sure. I, I don't go out much. But in the summer, uh, yeah, I, other activity, right? Yeah, you, certainly. But I I do that. Uh, I was while well, I was in. Uh, Rec Sports. I, I had the the good fortune. Uh, I was the president. That what they, their national organization is NERSA, National Intramural Recreation Sports Association. Mm-hmm. Uh, while I was at Marquette, uh, again we we thought we had things pretty good shape on campus, and we got very involved with the the national or, you know the state, and then the national. I was president of NERSA in uh, gosh. The late 70s, early 80s, uh, and I'm currently um, involved here on campus. The only the only thing I've done, I, I really have embraced the theory that uh, once you retire, I I, I don't want the, anybody at PAA think Larry's looking over their shoulder, or I just give them a hundred percent support and no attendance at, at anything. Uh, but uh, the rec- uh, the division of rec sports has got a 96 million dollar uh, renovation and uh, renewal of the division of rec sports, the co-rec gym, one of the largest in Purdue's history, and they were kind enough to invite me to sit on their steering committee. So uh, I am as excited as I've ever been about anything. Uh, to be a part of uh, the the rebirth of the Co-Rec Gym, uh, but okay. uh, so between the Co-Rec Gym and uh, uh, this oral history opportunity uh, and working with CAAE, uh, I 
I keep as busy as I as I want to be. Let's talk about the uh, the uh, Larry Pre the scholarship that uh, the fund that was an award when uh, you retired. Yeah, they were uh, staff and and alumni around the country, uh, and the board of directors uh, were were very kind to create that and alumni uh, from all over the country, and we even got some from you know, internationally. Uh, uh, who contributes. awards that? Does the association award the, the uh, it, it, or does it come under? It is certainly managed by the uh, development office. So it prob it's sure. probably, in fact, I'm, I shouldn't say probably, it is housed in the Purdue Research Foundation as is, is it probably 98% of the university scholarships are there. So it is one of hundreds of scholarships that they administer. Um, it, it, the, uh, it is for, I think we, we the, the, the parameters of it were we want to help the C plus students because <laughs> that was certainly my, uh, I represented that, uh, that group as an undergraduate. Uh, and preference given to students who uh, are majoring in uh, athletic training, uh, physical therapy, uh, exercise physiology. Uh, my master's degree was in that area, and uh, I thought uh, at the time that I was going to be a, a lab white coat kind of guy, but I quickly discovered that that wasn't worked open to not necessarily Indiana it's open to anyone absolutely it's okay. uh, any any student uh, anywhere uh, that has uh, that qualifies based on their grade point average and uh, successful completing I think it's a have to be here uh, uh, it's not for incoming freshmen okay. I think it's for sophomores and above and I get a report once a year what a I used to sign those reports sure. uh, is it renewable then? Yes. For the person so they it, get it, it the is. sophomore? Okay. Yeah, they, they are certainly eligible to get it the, the next oh, year. Um, have you ever met, have you met any of them? Uh, I get invited each year to meet them. I have not done that yet. I, I, uh, this has been since 2004, um, and I'm not sure why I don't do that. Uh, there must be, <laughs> maybe it's all the years that I... Uh, it was a part of my employment that I attended all of those scholarship Maybe. dinners and scholarships. Uh, I, I just uh, thought so many times I talked to the, you know, you'd, you'd be in a room with, with 30 kids and there'd be a dozen or so benefactors in there and I'd kind of whisper to the kid, you, is your guy here? And they go, oh, yeah, I've got to go talk to him. Because uh, kids are, are kids. They're certainly very appreciative and they're giving of their time. But I thought, well, you know, I, I don't want to be that guy that, uh, oh my God, I got to go talk to, I got to go talk to Dr. Prio. So <laughs> well, I, I, you know. that's my gift, my, my gift to the scholarship recipient. That they don't, that, carry that's, forward. Right. that's right. They don't have to go in and make nice with, with Larry Prio. And m maybe in a couple of years, I'll, I'll say, hell, hell I want to. <laughs> I'll go around with I think her. I'll go around yeah. with those kids. Um, yeah. How about a favorite Purdue tradition and your outstanding event? Any uh, comments on that? Perhaps the the old oak and bucket. Um, uh, the 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 new tradition that I had nothing to do with creating uh, and only attended as a, a staff member making a presentation, and that's this boiler gold rush. It's, it's a, if there is such a thing as a new tradition, uh, I see it, uh, the residence hall system, I believe, started the Boiler Gold Rush a number of years ago, and it has really grown. Uh, I see the young people that come in uh, and participate in it. Uh, it. It does all the right things for all the right reasons. I wish there was such a uh, such an experience when I was an undergraduate. I think those young people who go through Boiler Rush will pay dividends to this university and its alumni association. It's uh, a good Ten, fifteen, entry. yeah, you betcha. It's right. just uh, and that's a great tradition. 
uh, early on. Certainly the old oak and bucket, uh, I think, is uh, a, a wonderful tradition because it's so many other things uh, revolve around it. Um, I, I am finding fewer and fewer people in the university administration that are Purdue graduates. So a, as I embrace those wonderful things about our, our uh, university, uh, one of the things I, I worry about losing is the, the, so many of the Purdue traditions because we've become a bit corporate. Uh, and in a university this size, with this diversity and, and our mission, uh, we need to be corporate. Uh, and yet, uh, as a strong alumni guy, uh, we'll I, keep I, them here. Don't I, I really, really, really um, worry about uh, some of the revolving door uh, at. Uh, People who are in the sanctum sanctorum that are making those decisions that impact the lives of, of Purdue students, faculty, staff, and alumni uh, need to understand that Purdue didn't start three years ago when they were hired. Purdue has been here, and, and we've done quite well, thank you. Uh, and I... I uh, I'm sure we're going right. to. Wiser, wiser folks than, than right. myself will make those decisions. Yeah. And that. How about an outstanding event? Larry, you got something that comes to mind? Oh, gosh. Uh, an outstanding event. Uh, whenever uh, our astronauts come back to campus, uh, I, I believe that that's a unifying experience uh, uh, regardless of your major you know the uh, if you were a school of engineering or liberal arts it, it's not an engineering event I, I think the the return to this campus of our astronauts that's just one segment of a very successful alumni body we have but I, I think that just is 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 a is an exciting electrifying uh, weekend that I, I know of no other returning group or no other event that seems to fire up the, the community and the, the country at, at, at large to, to be able to say those are, you know, I, I, I went to class with that guy or that woman and Boy, she cut class just as much as I did. <laughs> Brings it down to earth, right? <laughs> You right. bet. Yes, yeah, ma'am, it right. does. Yes. Any closing comments that you care to share with us? Uh, gosh, you, you gave me an opportunity to, to, to mention my concern for Purdue didn't start three years ago or seven years sure. ago. Uh, it gave me a chance to talk about astronauts uh, just to be included in, in this uh in this oral history effort is is a real honor because I, I I saw the list and and see the list of people uh, that you've interviewed. Uh, uh, it's just fine, and I'd like to make one uh, one volunteer. When it comes time for uh, this university to tap your knowledge and your all of your experiences, I want to get this on tape that. When they when they look for someone to interview you, I hope I am one of those that are considered because if if you let you get away without being a part of this with a, a, a list of questions that I certainly couldn't come up with, but I could I could certainly utter. Uh, please let me put me on that list of people that wants to interview you before you retire or after you retire. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you, Larry. I Thank appreciate you. this. Concludes it. Thank you very, very much. Cool. Uh,